Blog Talk Radio. Are you ready to take a bite out of the competition? Are you looking for ideas to make your business better? Welcome to the Core Business Show with Tim G.K. Sponsored by Apple Capital Group. At the core of every successful business, you'll find people making a difference. And with each episode of The Core Business Show, we talk with those people, examine those ideas, and explore the strategies that make them special. Now, the host of The Core Business Show, Tim Jacquet. Good afternoon again, and welcome to another episode of The Core Business Show. I'm Tim Jacquet, your host, focusing on startup and small business on Blog Talk Radio Network. Our special guest, I'm really, really, really excited to have Carrie Vincent, who is a judge on the top-rated uh, show, the, the uh, Food Challenge on Food Network. If you'd like to speak to Ms. Vincent, you can give her a call at 347-324-3460, 347-324-3460, or you can pose a question in the chat room that I have open now, or you can go ahead and Twitter me at Hash sign Apple Capital. Before we begin, we're going to go ahead and play a clip from an interview from Ms. Vincent at OSU. It's going to be a conversation with me. I'm not going to give them a lecture. I want them to be interactive. I want them to understand where I came from and that all things are pretty much possible if you work hard, which most of them want to skip that step. I think students have to understand that they just can't finish course and say, okay, I'm an expert. You need to pay your dues. I have people that say to me, oh, um, I've finished Wilton 123, which means it's a basic decorating class, and I'm ready for challenge. My attitude is, come back in four or five years, and I want to talk to you. I will encourage you, but don't want to have what somebody else has worked 30 or 40 years for in four and a half minutes. It's not going to happen. Well, Carrie, listen, welcome to the program. What else can I say? <laughs> Good <laughs> afternoon, you know, everybody. <laughs> I know the best thing is like, uh, remind me of that phrase from the 70s, the way we got here, we earned it. <laughs> so Exactly, and actually I'm from that era too. I passed it by, so the latest era, which is in the last decade, which is skip everything and, and go to the top. But the people who are really <laughs> successful need to... As I said in that clip, uh, learn your craft, learn whatever business that you want to be involved in. It doesn't just apply to the cake decoration market, it's to everybody. So many people decide that when they want to get started, it's like my mother, my grandmother, my best friend said, oh, I'm fabulous at that and you must get into business. But so many people jump into business without the plan. And I think that in our niche business of cake decoration, it's worse probably than most areas. But certainly the hobby craft market is affected by it. So at the end of the day, learn everything you can, get to classes, talk to people who are in business successfully and see what it was that made them get up the ladder just a little faster or even after hard work, um, they certainly need to not just sit down and think, okay, I can do this because I can do this is surefire recipe for failure. You have to sit down and decide what your budget is, how you can afford to get yourself into the business Do you have Mm -hmm. to wait a bit to stack a few dollars on the edges in order to be able to start off properly? Or will you do, even as Oprah admitted it just recently, which really shocked me, she jumped too fast with OWN own. And I was really surprised when I read that because she is such a seasoned worldwide icon. And to think that she admitted that um, really goes to show that even the big guys can make a mistake. So when you don't have as much in your pea bank to deal with the ups and downs of setting up new business, then you need to make those choices thoughtfully and carefully. Wow. Great advice. I mean, uh, I remember seeing that as well, and I guess in the sense of Oprah, she is a master in her trade, like you have a person in a business, okay, they're really good with this particular trade, they're excellent with it, 
but also you still have to learn the business end of it as well. How to mm-hmm. market, how to manage, how to get things out of your workers. It's a whole piece. Even if you control equality, you still have this other piece that you really have to take care of. And that's really first thing they can always say, admit, oh, hey, I made a mistake and just move on from it and learn from it. It but I think possibly it's the, is the mistake, though. You yeah. know, sometimes it's that first huge mistake early in the piece can be the powder keg that blows up the whole plan. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's legalizing yourself, knowing that there are laws about what you can and cannot do that are relative from state to state. You have to investigate what is right for you in the state in which you live. Cake folk just do whatever they want to do with little regard for that in the mainstream of hobbyist and at-home cake bakers. There are cottage mm-hmm. industry laws in Texas and elsewhere that permit people to bake out of the home. But that does not mean that you have to act like a slob. It means that you set aside a place in your home specific to cake decoration. Your kitty cat is not in there. Your wasp pup is not, on, uh, not in there. And your children are not chasing their way through there. Cake Paraphernalia, i.e. pots and pans and all of that, mixes and so forth, should be kept completely separate from what happens in your normal household day. So uh, if people bear that in mind, and also they should all take themselves to the sanitation department in their cities and get Mm -hmm. a clean bill of health with that. Most of them are baking without benefit of knowing some of the really awful things, the nuts and bolts that make successful cake making uh, a given, uh, they totally just think that's not, sorry, that doesn't apply to them. It Mm -hmm. applies to everybody. And a food handler's license is simply uh, the first step. Understand what you cannot do. Understand what you can do. There are ways of washing your pots and pans and so forth. Um, that you should be paying attention to. It doesn't go in with kitchen dinner, the leftovers, after you've finished the meal at night and everything go in at once. It needs to be sanitized when you're dealing with the public. And this is a big issue between the hobbyist out there who is having a wonderful time because they don't have the overheads of the small business who has registered itself and spent a ton of money in order to be acceptable to the Food and Health Department. And there's a big glitch between the two parties because, you know, one side, the business side, looks at the other with envy and in, on, and also it affects their pocketbook because they are saying, well, I'm spending all this money to do it right and have these inspectors coming by checking my business and yet the hobbyist on the other side of the coin is able to go pretty much scot-free with no inspections at all. And so with that, though, goes a real responsibility for that at-home or hobbyist person who really needs to find out the best way for them to deal with their business within the home and make sure that it's absolutely pristine and going to whatever function it's going in very good shape. I have seen all sorts of horror stories with people who did really bad things um, over the years that I've been in the business, and I would like this message to go to them to say, pull up your socks, clean up your act, and act professionally if that's what you want to do. Okay. You mentioned uh, a few seconds ago about the cottage law. What is the cottage Mm -hmm. law? These cottage laws are bills that go through uh, local local and state government. It affects the... The, the businesses throughout the, the state, it usually starts off at state uh, capital level where they mm-hmm. decide that uh, they will, after much lobbying by the various entities, uh, to get this state cottage law in place. 
I don't remember the bill numbers for every state, but there's always a huge fight between the professionals and the hobbyists who feel in this particular economic climate, it is their due to work from home. And if it's the law that they can, I have no problem with it. All I am asking them is to be responsible. The cottage law means in a sense that they can work out of their home and take customers and in Texas, I think there's like, they can earn $50,000. Um, it may be $20,000. I'm not sure. I've read it maybe mm-hmm. a year and a half, two years ago, where they can earn that kind of money um, out of their homes. Um, and it, in the big scheme of things, is a lot of money because it's a lot of cake. And it's a lot of cake that's being prepared and going out. I just want to make sure by sending them a message that they need to make sure that the area that they have set aside to bake and to decorate in is as it should be, thoughtful, not just, oh, I'm economically deprived and so therefore I'm just going to set aside a small corner on my kitchen table and whatever hell is happening on the rest of the table, um, you'll just bake and decorate around it. This place needs to be clean walls, clean tables, all the countertops cleaned off, and that's not always the case. Wow. So, Is this more than you wanted to know? (laughs) No, it was really helpful. Um, What they should have, what items they should be able to have if they say, hey, I want to start something out of my home. I don't Mm -hmm. have the money to do it. I've seen some real successful stories. People started at Mm -hmm. home and they kept growing. They they started as a caterer, usually. Right. Uh, they'll start as, oh, I'm baking cookies for uh, my organization, and then, mm-hmm. hey, those tea cakes taste good. You need to do this full time. Then they, mm-hmm. you know, they do the honest thing. They, they go step by step. How will you advise a person, hey, you want to become a, a professional baker. You have a clientele that you already built. This is what step by step you need to do. Well, I think the most important thing is if a person is in a state that has the home bill cottage law and legally they are allowed to bake out of their home uh, base, then they need to, uh, obviously they will have orders and they can grow all by themselves and make quite a lot of money in the process. The big Mm -hmm. question is more the states that don't have the cottage law where people are sneaking around, um, you know, hoping not to, quote unquote, get caught is the word that's out there. And uh, they are the ones who really want to do something significant with their baking skills. And they're trapped because they don't have the money to get into business or have no inclination. It's both both parties. Um, but on the on the other side of the coin, I think it's really important that they investigate opportunities to bake legally. They can rent a kitchen, rent part of somebody else's k- kitchen. I know people in Michigan, for example, who offer uh, the op- sorry. I know people in Michigan who actually will rent out their kitchens at night to people who want to bake and just do a small amount of baking. Um, Some of them have a shop within a shop. You know, they'll get in with an existing baker and make a deal where they can do the decorated cakes and the baker gets on with the muffins and all of that sort of thing and bread making. And so um, they can make a deal. uh, But then again, you run into small towns that maybe don't have that. And you certainly couldn't do that with the likes of Walmart or, you know, any of the big stores. It's going to be something that's uh, a business that's smaller. Um, You can rent a church hall that's not used when you want to bake and make Mm -hmm. sure that it goes into a kitchen that's um, clean. And, um, And that gets you right out of your family activity, which I think is the big problem, is separating family from your cake-driven business. And I think that it's all a matter of getting your name out there, taking the opportunity to act within the social media, um, get your work known, and so easy these days in comparison to the 80s when I was wandering around trying to get started. Um, There was no social media. There was no Mm -hmm. email. 
You would be lucky if you got your cake in a magazine and everybody would rush out and buy it and ooh, ah, ooh, ah, ooh, fabulous. Um, this person is starting to get known because their cakes are more and more frequently in the print media. You mm-hmm. had an opportunity to offer yourself to local TV and right now, of course, Easter is a great time if people want to make eggs and impress somebody, an anchor or whomever, or somebody that's doing the early morning shows. They're always looking for people who want to do food, and they also like what we do because it films well. That's the one key that a cake decorator has is the fact that we make pretty food. It's oh, my not gosh. not just a stew, you know. <laughs> I love that your cake amazing online. Stuff. I looked at your cakes online, and my mouth just started dropping. Not only that, I love I'm a, I love pastries. I love cake. I mean, that's probably my weakness. Um, just about everybody I in saw- the United States. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but when I saw yours, I'm like, I said, my gosh, I wish I had that for my wedding. <laughs> and, you know, my first comedian and so forth, I mean, it's like a work of art. It's like... The cake looked like you will have it for Queen Elizabeth. It looked like it's what she will order. And I looked at all the detail and said, my gosh, the detail that you put into the particular cakes. And um, I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing. That, I mean, it's truly art. It is an art. And I think that uh, initially when I was trying to establish myself with roll fondant and gum paste, which is the medium that you were looking at. Mm-hmm. There wasn't very much of that in this country, just small pockets here and there. And everything was buttercream, buttercream, buttercream. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with buttercream. Love mm-hmm. buttercream. But you should have choices. It shouldn't be just one medium for everything. So um, for quite a few years, I was making my own roll fondant and gum paste. And sometimes... When you get to a point, it's very, very heavy to make. And I burned out several mixes. Uh, It's just so concentrated. It just needs to be hand done or in a huge machine. And Mm -hmm. so I was fed up. I had muscles growing on top of muscles. And I got in touch with... Uh, American, sorry, Australian backles who became eventually American backles and talked them into coming to meet me in the United States to talk about setting up a factory in this country to start making commercial rolled fondant. Mm-hmm. We did that in 1989 and for a decade it was really shooting in the breeze. It was so hard. Nobody wanted to talk to us. Everybody had a good reason to be using buttercream. They hated the taste of it. It was because they didn't know how to use it. They didn't know how to apply it. But they were very resistant because a lot of the people who were particularly well-known in their art and craft chose not to be interested because they were already very fast at what they did. And having to learn a new medium was really a bit of an Achilles heel to them. They didn't really want to have to start out as beginners in an entirely new medium. Mm -hmm. But through persistence and getting the medium published here, there, and everywhere, and, of course, eventually into the ubiquitous Martha Stewart and Brides magazine, they embraced it because actually roll fondant and gum paste is a photographer's dream. No knife marks, no imperfections on the surface of the cake it can be perfect and so when you are having a spread of cakes it's lovely to look at pristine so um once martha put the good housekeeping seal of approval things rolled along a little smoother then Mm -hmm. people were starting to realize well if martha says it's okay then maybe we better look again and so then in 2002 the Oklahoma State Sugar Art Show that I run, um, I had this vision that Food Network should need to come and actually tape the show and have a special on it. So I pushed for it and got my wish, and most of the cakes there were roll fondant and gum paste by this stage. And when the special aired, 
it was really quite remarkable the response people from all over wanted to know what that smooth stuff was which mm-hmm. was actually roll fondant and so then the game was on i didn't realize at that particular juncture that food network had commissioned high noon entertainment to produce a, comp- a competition show about cake decoration and make it into a challenge they hadn't really decided how it was going to be yet, but it was in the works. Mm-hmm. The producer who came to Oklahoma to produce the special on the Sugar Arts show went back to High Noon and said to Tom Geeson, her name was Michelle Bills, um, I've found, I think I've found our judge. And I got a call shortly afterwards asking me if I would like to be a part of Challenge very simple, you know, so so accidental. And I said, oh, sure. You know, I, I didn't really even know what they were up to. And then mm-hmm. I headed off to the first show to judge and competitors were using roll fondant and gum paste and that was the next kick in the tail that roll fondant and gum paste got. And from then on, the game was on. Cake has been on fire ever since, not only in the United States, but abroad. The market shares are going up up, up. Everybody wants to get into cake. Even people are changing professions. I can't tell you how many lawyers who are now making cakes or fine arts people who were great in their chosen profession in galleries and so forth that made the transition easily into decorated cake. So it's had a really an on fire last 10, 11 years. Before that, it was just slumbering, and for the decade before these last 10 years, it was an uphill battle to get it off the ground. So myself and John Bush, who was with Backles and is now with another company called Fondex, Mm -hmm. um, he and I chuckle to each other every once in a while because he was the R&D guy at Backles, and I was there really supporter with figuring out what the best taste and flavor would be for the United States. So we did a lot of test kitchen things. And now we see about 35 companies who have evolved from that, who are making a living and keeping shoes on their children's feet. And all because of that question that I asked many years ago to Australians who actually did respond to it. So, um, it's kind of a nice feeling to be able to sit down and say, survey the whole picture and say, well, if I hadn't done that, maybe it would have come, but it would have been a lot later. Much it's, later. I think it's just yeah. the, in business, it's a sense of timing, but you never know mm. when is that time to do stuff. Because some people will be progressive and bring something earlier, and it doesn't work because people either not ready or one person told me on Friday, everything has to be in a certain place in order to move forward with something. Mm-hmm. So if those things are not, yeah, if, well, maybe people have done it I'm in not going to say I was a genius, though. <laughs> it's, it's just that I was so fed up making that stuff that it's just like, now, what can I do to effect this change? Can I talk somebody into doing it commercially? And, Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it was no good going to the American market because nobody had made it before. And so I had to go foreign because they had been making it for decades and decades and decades. And even homemade had been made for over a century. So this was a completely new thing for the American market. And even the big guys who usually are looking for something new, like Bake Mark and... and, um, the, the companies that make a difference in the global picture of production, they mm-hmm. didn't jump on it too easily. They all looked at it. It was all too, too hard. Now I am hearing things from them um, and seeing things written that, oh, you know, we're the experts on roll fondant and gum paste, but they were actually late to the game. And, um, and I laugh because, you know, they did... <laughs> have such a resistance but it's here to stay now and if you go to if you would have gone to a competition in the 1980s you would have seen buttercream 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 competition pieces everywhere 
and you would have seen maybe one to five pieces of roll fondant and gum pieces, competition pieces. Now it's reverse, and I actually am encouraging people to not forget buttercream because I think it's a very important part of the American history and part of something that's been amazingly successful and will always be at somebody's birthday somewhere. But Mm -hmm. um, there needs to be not such the seesaw swing. Let's level it out and say, okay, we are good at all of these things and whatever customer walks in the door, we can respond. Just don't specialize in one thing. Okay. We're going to take a, a short station break real quick, and then we come back and talk about the levels of bakery with cakes, um, you know, cakes and with the difference between cakes and pastries, what's the mm-hmm. movement of cupcakes in this. So we're going to take a, a break real quick, and we'll come back with uh, Carrie Vincent. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. Apple Capital Group in Jacksonville, Florida, is a commercial lender that specializes in asset-based loans, equipment leasing and financing, invoice financing, commercial real estate loans, and asset-based financing in the U.S. and Canada. Apple Capital Group is a direct lender that lends on their private equity investment portfolio. 90% of most loans are decided within two hours and vendor funding within 24 hours after documents are completed with a one-page application. No slow no's, just a quick decision and a fast yes. To get more information about lending from Apple Capital Group, call 866-611-7457. That's 866-611-7457 to speak with one of our loan specialists. Or visit us right now at applecapitalgroup.com. You're listening to The Core Business Show, sponsored by Apple Capital Group. We're back with Carrie Vincent, uh, judge on the Food Network Challenge Show. I guess let's just the jump tough in. The judge, the nasty tough judge, judge, the wicked the judge, judge, the bitter judge, none of those things. I am the straightforward, straight shooting from the shoulder. If you don't like to hear it, then don't get on challenge because every time... I hear people say that, and then they have watched it before they get on the show. They know what's coming. It's mm-hmm. part of what makes reality TV. Reality TV is really not reality at all. It's basically a performance. It's to do with competitors who want to get their act together and get something decent on the table to be judged. It's a tough thing for them to do. They're being asked to do things that are totally inappropriate for the time frame that they're offered and I honestly marvel at how wonderfully well they do but it is not a straightforward competition about skill it is about reality television somebody's going to get thrown under the bus if they put themselves out there and make Mm -hmm. really stupid mistakes but they are also in the running a four-in-one chance of winning ten thousand dollars racehorse odds are not that good And so I think that they actually are in a pretty good position. And whatever they do, win, lose, or draw, and of course it's never draw, Mm -hmm. um, they will inevitably have a lot of uh, airtime that they will actually should, if they are smart, and most of them don't, turn into a positive to focus back into their business. They can use those clips. They can let their friends and customers know that they were on television. And even if it's surprising, even the ones who have a really bad day seem to come out smelling like roses. At the time, I'm sure they are humiliated because they didn't do what they thought they should and great expectations. And when you are under the microscopic eye of those massive cameras that miss nothing, um, You know before you go in there, if you make a blunder, it's going to be mentioned. And not only is it going to be mentioned, but they are told. We have a judges meeting right before, the day before they get started, and it's clear from the producers that they are going to be criticised if they don't get it right, and they will be complimented. They get both. 
But unfortunately, in this human psyche of ours, we only mm-hmm. remember the bad things. We never remember the good things. And even if you get three great good comments and one bad one, the one that's going to hurt is, is the bad one, and you should be concentrating on the good ones. But if you are smart and a return competitor and listen to what I have to say, because I've been seeing all of these other people come through before, then you will take that to heart. And you mm-hmm. would be a fool if you come back and do it all over again without making wow. the change. Now, what I've, I've noticed, uh, I went to, my wife and I went to a bakery outside of Los Angeles. Uh, she works for the airline, and she will always go to this beach. I can't think of the beach uh, right out near the airport. But Torrance. we ran into uh, Manhattan. In other, Manhattan Beach. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And... Um, uh, there's a cupcake place there, and I do have a question regarding cupcakes. Uh, and we say, oh, we thought we saw you on the, uh, uh, the was it, you know, the cupcake edition of it. And she said, yeah, we tried to get on there, and we, we got thrown off. <laughs> but we're going to practice. We're going to take their advice, and we we made it to the first round. They mm-hmm. came back with their A game, and they won the second time because they listened. They took right. exactly everything the into point. heart. And not only the judge to listen to is the crab, because they yeah. are the ones who are sitting there watching and will be expected. It was expected that I would be the one to drive the nail in. And if you watch the shows, it doesn't matter whether you watch Cupcake Wars or you watch Food Network Challenge, any of the others that are out there. They all have the positives and the negatives, and there have been many competitors. I mean, Michelle Bomarito from Food Network Challenge absolutely massacred her first cake that she did, and she became the darling of the public because they were so empathetic about her. Later on, trial and error, she came back, she was resilient, and she eventually won Challenge, and it took her many efforts to win Challenge, but she can say now... I have a challenge under my belt. So there is that nice feeling about having that notoriety. And I absolutely can understand uh, how your cupcake uh, friends felt because it is nice to go in there, listen, learn the ropes, and get that one under your belt. Most people think they should win the first time round. The first time round really should be a a touchy-feely thing about, you know, how does this all work? Do something Mm -hmm. really great, but not overly ambitious. I see cake decorators particularly have eyes bigger than their stomachs when it comes to creating a cake. The rules clearly say all we need is a three-foot cake. And I have people in front of me building six- and seven-foot-high cakes. Three-foot cakes are enough in an eight-hour period. Follow Mm -hmm. the rules. Read the rules. I know competitors who have come to challenge by the time the judges meeting, which is usually around about 7 o'clock the night before, and they are going to be hauled out of bed at 4 in the morning to get started. And at that point, they have not read the rules. Wow. I cannot imagine why anybody leaving home with a van or an aircraft full of tools and things because they have to bring everything. The only thing that Mm -hmm. stands there is the mixer and refrigeration and heating. Everything else they, they bring with them. It's an expensive operation. I, Bronwyn Weber told me once when I inquired to get a bit of an idea and she said my FedEx bill was three grand. And wow. she is one of the great ladies, uh, competitors of Food Network Challenge. And she was fortunate because her bakery backs her. But if you are a small business and you're looking for that opportunity, don't blow it because you haven't read the rules. It's crazy. Wow. Well, it's, it's just amazing. In that same case, I don't think, like you mentioned, they're not, they only been, uh, they haven't paid their dues. They haven't really... Re- Taken the uh, the challenge seriously, exactly. They take for granted that hey, I'm going to win, but you're going with some of the best people. Who some people have read the rules, of course, and um, you come there with this expense for one. You mm-hmm. need to go with your A game. You need to go to win. 
And mm-hmm. even if you lose, it's still a win-win because you still have those clips. You still made it to the show. Mm-hmm. And you might be the little dog with his, his tail between the knees. But, however, you still have free publicity out of that. And if you win, it's just still sure. uh, another win. Yeah. I say to them all, when it's over, I am the only judge who goes from kitchen to kitchen consistently every single challenge and talk to them if they want to talk to me after the fact after the cameras are closed and everything is over and they are packing up to get out of there and say is there anything you want to ask and some of them are upset because they didn't win and I say to them if you don't want to talk now here's my number you can call me and talk privately I'm quite happy to do that but once we are cast for a new challenge if you happen to be coming back Don't call me because I can't talk to you. While we're both free and easy and there is no challenge in sight, then I can tell them everything they want to know. Quite a few of them do take the time to do that. Amazingly, Mm -hmm. I would say three-quarters of them don't worry. But if I would be in their shoes, once I got home and the dust settled, the first thing I would do was have me on speed dial and say, okay, I want another crack at this. What the heck did I do wrong? Uh, Really over and above, you know, all of the hype of the the conversation on television. It can be much deeper than that. Some of them just completely overestimate what they're capable of. And once again, by not reading the rules and thinking, oh, I can do that. I mean, I hear so many decorators. I can do that. No, you can't. Because there you were in front of millions of people making absolute hash of everything because you chose to do this six-foot thing, which I would have been very happy as a judge just to see as a three-foot thing. Crazy. Yeah, I've seen the show uh, over the past year, and I say, oh, my gosh, you're making it so complicated. You know, if I have some, you know, uh, a figure that has arms on it, uh, you got to be careful on how to support that. Just the, the science of that <laughs> itself. Okay, uh, you can't put something that heavy up that doesn't have anything to support. And if you put something to support, then it's going to look weird. So, well, the other thing <laughs> is, too, you have to remember the message that you're sending to America. And subsequently, since challenges in 150 nations, now mm-hmm. around the world. You cannot use things that are not food safe or food friendly. So you have to be careful with armatures. You can't put copper. I had a big issue with the production company because they didn't realize that they should be saying no to uncovered copper. I said, I don't mind if they use copper piping to make these armatures, but I want them plastic coated so that none of that leaching gets into the food. And so we have to be extremely careful because people see things on TV and they see something that took eight hours and two people to make and it arrives on their television screen in 42 to 44 minutes, depending on advertising. And the general public thinks, oh, that only took them 40 minutes to do that. They don't realize all the prep that goes even before the eight hours starts. So these things, these sculptures and so forth are expensive. And that's another issue that we have to deal with as cake artists because people come into bakeries consistently saying, "Eh, oh, you want $2,000 for that or $3,000 or $4,000, whatever. As everybody has now realized, Cake art is art along with all the other art forms, and it takes time. The only difference is the other art forms last, and cake art doesn't. It's going to be consumed. So we have to change the perception in the public's brain that we should not be thought of less just because we chose an edible art form. And um, and they have to be realistic about the time it takes to do that. We had a, a person just got onto one of my uh, social media outlets and she was saying that this person came in and expected a huge sculpted cake for like $50. And, I mean, it wasn't even realistic. And um, 
she told them, you know, the minimum I can do it is two and a half thousand, and they nearly lost their teeth. They were so, uh, you know, shocked that that it only took a little while on TV. And I said, well, the TV is edited, and people need to really relate to that. And I think it's easy to be drawn into that picture and think, well, you know, it it went by quickly. But if you really think about it as the consumable, uh, consuming public, you need to give the Cape people a shot um, and, A, ask them something reasonable for reasonable return and keep everybody's price bracket in tune. And there are a lot of things that the customer asks Cape people to do that Cape people are very happy to do, and I wish they weren't, and that is licensed characters. So many licensed characters are integrated into cake design. And one mm-hmm. of these light years, it's going to be an explosion. Disney is going to have enough or Dr. Seuss or all of them out there. Dora the Explorer, Hello Kitty, you name it. They are all copyrighted licensed characters. And cake people are making them with gay abandon. Well, I've wow. told them over and over and over again. Don't do it because all of those companies have slews of lawyers that have nothing better to do than wander around the Internet. And one day they, they will drop the hammer on some of this stuff and somebody's going to go crying and say, oh, woe is me. Just say no. And the message to the public listening is, please, please, please don't ask. There are lots of things that people can create from their own imaginations that would be perfect cakes for birthdays, celebrations and anniversaries, you name it, that can be created without taking somebody else's hard work and owning it for free. Uh, there mm-hmm. are companies, you know, big bakeries that do uh, have access to licensed characters because they pay Disney, Universal and so forth the money to do that. But there are very strict parameters and I get this response from cake folk who say, oh, well, I'm just a little cake person. But you're not just an only little cake person because hundreds of thousands of you are doing it. And that makes a lot of cake people doing it. So, um, you know, I mean, you have to be fair and you have to be honest in your business and Mm -hmm. only do the things that are legal for you to do. And while I'm on the subject of that, uh, there are a lot of other things that get into cakes that are wonderful in the romantic mind, but are absolutely impossible when it comes down to reality. And that is asking people to asking the public asking for feathers to be used in a cake. Feathers come from birds. Huh? Is that sanitary? Exactly my point. They don't care. They're buying these feathers from the hobby stores and sticking the quills straight into the cakes. Ugh. First of all, they are made in on factory floors that have nothing to do with sanitation or food service. And number two, um, the fact is they still have the bird's dander and all sorts of malt that goes on. As soon as you get it anywhere near a cake, I've seen them wrapped in marabou feathers. I've seen ostrich plumes spiking out of the top. It is a no-no. Do not do it because you cannot sanitize a feather. It's a living, even if it's been pulled out of the animal, it's still an organism that's still living. It's, it's cult, uh, a, a, a bacteria-laden and it's absolutely something that you shouldn't put around food. And it's fashionable at the moment. I think that Every cake person who's learned to make everything else should learn to make sugar feathers. And I've made them. They're not difficult to make. And maybe they don't quite look as close to the real thing, but certainly well enough a facsimile that everybody should be happy. And then the other thing that's also a big no-no, no wires ever should penetrate the surface of a cake because if one wire escapes from the flower head or the decoration that it's supporting and disappears into a cake serving, that could hurt somebody. It could end up in the back of their throat, in their lungs or in their stomach without them even knowing or swallowing and getting a shock 
and boom, it's gone before they realize. And so a lot of people do this and I wish they wouldn't because it's also setting themselves up for a lawsuit in the future. And if you wow. are a small business and you are setting yourself up to grow, the last thing in your world you ever want to have is a lawsuit, whether it be over licensed characters or foodstuffs or things that have been applied to foodstuffs that are absolutely a no-no. So everything should be edible. Uh, yep. Nothing should be foreign that is not edible is on any cake or cupcake or whatever. Right. Well, everybody knows that in order to make flowers and some decorations, you need to have a wire support. It's what we call an armature. But it mm -hmm. does not need to be inserted into the cake. It can be made into corsages. It can be made into wreaths, all sorts of different contorted efforts in order to satisfy the artistic appeal on the cake. But honestly, just don't do it. One of these light years, it will happen. It's happened abroad. And in my country, in Australia, it became a federal issue because I think it was 1950s, in the early 50s, a small child and little kids run around, get so excited at parties and things, they don't know what they're eating half the time. And a child swallowed it, um, a wire, and it went to the lung. And immediately wow. there was a massive hue and cry about it, and the government got right into it and said, okay, that's it, no more wires go into cakes. And so Australians learned to do everything that they needed to do without having to do that. But America has no rules, so they just do whatever they see fit or emulate from somebody else who showed them, a teacher that may have taught them to do it. Mm -hmm. Wrong protocol. Don't wow. do it. Figure out another Talk way. Okay. Talking about the, the, the cartoon characters, um, is there an association like music? We have, like, for example, the show we, we license through B&I. Uh, mm -hmm. You're American playing the game. <laughs> Yeah, but however, for is there an industry or an association that kind of help with these cartoon characters? You know, uh, you know, two year old love door. They don't care where you get it from. Right. You know, Walmart has it. They, that's what they want. If they choose Walmart or this other thing. They want right. door regardless. Or right. Well, bar. Walmart paid for it. You see, so Walmart mm -hmm. doesn't have a problem. If I mean, I'm I'm not sure if Walmart did pay for it, but let's say. If Walmart is doing licensed characters, I would bet my bottom dollar that I they just they didn't walk out there and say, well, I think I'll use Dora today. I think they just went straight to whomever they wanted to go to and say, okay, I want to do this licensed character in, uh, I want to license this character to use in my bakery. And I am sure the pyramids of this world and the Kroger's and all of those other that have big buying power can afford to do that. The people who are doing it are the smaller bakeries and the small, you know, run custom mom and pop or just mom, uh, not necessarily the pop part of it, um, and the hobbyist. And people are thinking, oh, well, nobody will find out. But with the life that we have with social media now, the minute people make a cake, Impulsive. they can't wait to take a picture of it and share it with us. But us is not just one person. It's getting out there to millions of people, including Disney, Universal, and any other of the big companies that are producing characters that they've spent thousands, thousands, and thousands of hours creating those characters and paying millions and millions of dollars in order to that vision to be sorted and finalized that at the end of it all um you know they kind of you you have to understand why they would be protective and that's why there's such a thing called a copyright and trademarks and so forth and they are registered and it's clear we all know what they are i won't do them i have never done one and I'm quite proud of that because I managed to get by and do everything that I wanted to do in the art of decorating without doing it. And I always said, no, some other bunny can do it as far as I'm concerned when a, a customer would come and say, I want this, I want that. So, well, you can have it, but not from me. And I would rather lose a customer than do something what I consider illegal. And you 
are playing by the rules because you are paying those royalties in order to use the soundtracks and so forth. The music industry is very well covered. Um, and ours is too, except there's a big, we have no middle class among us. We are either very small business or very big business. And big business can afford the revenues, but the smaller business can't. They just don't have $100,000, you know, sitting idly by so that they can go and get a hold of those uh, copyrights or, or the rights. Okay, so what I said was uh, they need to go, anybody interested in getting the rights or licensing rights needs to go to the companies involved. So you want Disney, go to Disney. You want Universal, go to Universal. Dr. Seuss, Dr. Seuss. And um, should it be Sesame Street? So forth. That way, um, you know, you're going to deal with a lawyer and they are going to talk a lot of money. There is no question about it. Wow. Wow. Is there a uh, a way, when you mentioned earlier on the top of the show, um, mm-hmm. a way that, well, just back up a second. Are there any associations for bakers that they can belong to? That, yes. That we, have, uh, we have ISIS, the International Cake Exploration Society, which is clearly found at ISIS.org on the Internet. There okay. is also the Retail Bakers Association. Uh, there are many, many, so you just Google them. Uh, the cake decorators one is probably, ISIS would be the one. Uh, I also run the Oklahoma State Sugar Art Show, which is an organization, another 501, that um, I promote competition and some education in the sugar arts. In fact, I'm having um, fun with sugar on April the 15th, which is a seminar purely organized for people to come and learn techniques from some of the great ones. So I have 14 of some of the leading decorators in the country who will be volunteering to put on this afternoon, and they will have this afternoon on April 15th for $22 for the afternoon. You wow. can't get anything cheaper. Any class that you would want to have costs a fortune in the sugar arts these days. Used not to be, but it's changing rapidly because of this great growth in sugar craft and this great hunger for learning and for new people wanting to find a place to go. And so I have this every year, and all of us donate our time. No money passes hands, and we make sure that uh, all of us create something that those visiting are going to be able to take home and utilize. And it's very important that this ongoing education happens. ISIS, on the other hand, is about convention and demonstrations and um, vendors. And so, um, but the main key is focus is on education. And so anybody that would want to go to that event, you will find all of the information. It's going to be in Reno, Nevada this year. Mm-hmm. So anybody who is um, interested in going to that can find that on the Internet very easily. And then the Sugar Art Show that I run in October every year, which will be October 29 and 30, is the largest Judge Sugar Art Show in the United States with the most entries. We have 82,000 people who come. And the only bigger one is in the United Kingdom where they have a denser population, 70 million people parked in a little tiny country. And in the United States, we have um, 310 million, but they are spread way, way, way apart. So I have competitors who drive across the country, 16, 17,000 miles, just to compete here. And it's an amazing event, and you see absolutely spectacular cakes. Wow. So there's many, many opportunities at a local level. Each state has their own uh, cake show pretty much these days. And um, But the best of the best, it's always great to see them come together and fight it out to see who really is the one <laughs> who can carry that title away. Wow. How did you come up with the phrase, I have a question here, uh, I do not approve, is what part of you know that <laughs> someone's asking. I know exactly where it came from, and I did not say that. Actually, it's a, it's a really a satirical. It was <laughs> foodnetworkhumor.com who likes to take – are really pot shots at all of the so-said celebrity um, cake or 
food artists that are on Food Network, and they have this really peculiar picture of me with this type over the top that says, I do not approve. Uh, well, maybe I don't approve, but I'm not sure what I was saying at that moment. They just took the liberty of swiping one of my pictures off the TV set, a still, and writing that across there. So they were actually having a laugh at my expense. But what they don't really realize is I thought it was funny too. And so uh, I do not approve if people do not prepare themselves well to appear on challenge. So that um, is pretty straightforward. But I have never said on challenge to my memory, and somebody might correct me and say I did, but I absolutely believe that I have never said the words I do not approve to anybody. (laughs) I will not say anything personal to anybody. A lot of people say I'm tough and, you know, I'm cruel, I'm this, I'm that. But if they really think about what I say, they will know that what is said is about the work. It is not about the person. It's not personal. It's always about the shortcomings or the great things. I mean, some people burst into tears when I tell them that something they did was fabulous. And others are upset because I don't like what they did and I point out why I was disappointed rather than don't like. Um, And I will say I was disappointed in something because I also know a lot of the competitors personally and I know what they're capable of. And yes, everybody can have a really bad hair day no matter what business they're in. All of this applies to anything any of us do. But truly... um, Try not to take those comments in any other way than they were intended and always about the work, not about the person. I am not saying, oh, I don't like the nose on your face. I am saying that there are things that you need to fix on your sugar piece, uh, show piece. Okay. Um, Talking about, I have a question here regarding wedding cakes. What is the Mm -hmm. expectation as a price range of wedding cakes should cost? It all depends on the skill level. I priced high when I was baking in business. In fact, my business card read, I do not open my oven door under $2,000, so don't bother me. Um, And I was really being elitist about it because I realized that cake designers were paid very badly for cake work and they put hours and hours in. It's very hard to determine what a person should charge without seeing their work. If you are a beginner, then you have to charge accordingly. And if you are intermediate, then you step it up a bit. I see some prices that they charge are absolutely laughable because, you know, charging $1.25 a serve, that's outrageous. But if you're a beginner, that is not outrageous because you haven't earned your stripes yet and you don't deserve more. But you need to be able to... Enhance your skills over time and grow, and as you grow, so does your price. So there are some people out there that could probably say, flat tack, I am going to charge $10,000 for this particular piece of work that I've just completed, and I would look at it and say, yes, you deserve it. But I see other people who are trying to charge high, and they really shouldn't be. And the reason I did it in the first place was because I wanted to break that line. Um, Nobody else was game to, and I was in a position where if I didn't get a cake order, it did not bother me so much because I had enough to keep me going. And if I lost one because of principle, then that was fine. And sometimes you have to learn to say no occasionally um, because that then sends a message with that customer away from your place. They will talk about the fact that, well, she wouldn't do it for $1.25, but she'd do it for three fifty. And three fifty a serve, I think, is fine because with a, a buttercream cake, because if you go for a dessert anywhere in a restaurant, you are going to pay more than three fifty and for a slice of cake on the plate. Um, This person not only has to make the cake and get it where it can be sliced to go onto your plate, they have to drive it there. They have to set it up. All of these things have to be taken into consideration as accelerating costs that come to a place where you, the person who is the creator, is satisfied that they're getting a fair return on what they've done 
and the customer also is happy because it's not over the top. I think you also have to test your own market. I continually hear small towns in small rural America that no matter how hard these designers and bakers try, they cannot get a higher price because the community won't support it. The luckier ones live in bigger cities where they are getting higher prices for cakes, but that's because there's a huge population for them to draw on. So it's very difficult uh, for me to say to a listener without seeing their work what they should be charging. However, they can post on my Facebook after we finish here, and I would be quite happy to look and see if I can help determine what should be charged. And what are you going to be looking for if they send you a copy of their, their best work? Well, if I'm looking at a cake and, you know, the piping's pretty rough and it's pretty simply decorated, I'm not going to tell them that they need to get $2,000 for that cake. If they ever want to get $2,000 for the cake, first of all, they're going to have to drift away from cake mixers and start making proper scratch cakes because people will pay more for that. Um, but convenience is good, and when they're churning out a lot of cake, um, you know, the, the mixes are great too, but I'm not saying that you should have a war from one to the other. It's just about what you need to do in order to grow. Okay. You know, one thing I've noticed, I uh, was looking at a show a few, me last fall, and I come to a realization, when it comes to weddings, I mean, it's, you know, you really don't have to underbid uh, yourself because the brides are willing to pay for the expense. And if you're coming back at $1,000, then mm-hmm. they may look at you a little bit differently because everybody else is quoting a lot of money for a wedding cake. And, mm-hmm. um, and really, they don't have, they have a budget, but they don't have a budget. They, mm-hmm. uh, if that makes sense, they know but the it- dress costs $10,000. They don't do what they can to do ten thousand dollars in the cake. Let me tell you about the brides. Mm-hmm. I love the brides because they are part of our business, but they think that the cake is the last thing on their list, and it really is annoying when they will go and spend a fortune on the florist. They'll spend a fortune on the dress. I've had them tell me, I shipped my dress in from Italy and it cost $85,000. Oh and I'm going to have this five-course meal and it's going to cost a gazillion billion at Blah Function um, Room in Blah Hotel or Country Club. And, oh, I'm nearly out of money and I need to order of a cake. Well, I just straight away say, if you're nearly out of money, first of all, you don't, need, you don't know how to budget And second of all, don't come to me because I am not giving up my standards for all of the over-expenditure on the other thing. If you want an $85,000 dress, you better keep aside a $10,000 budget for the cake because I know that you've probably spent ten dollars to $15,000 minimum on the flowers. So cake people actually have been put at the bottom of the list for so long that now, because of this ascendant interest in cake decoration and cake design, we're starting to shrug that off a little bit. But it's always, you know, you look on TV, it's all about the dress, it's all about the hair, it's all about the flowers, um, but they really look at cake like it's a postscript. And I think that barrier, as we speak, is being hammered down, but it's not gone. And even now I hear people saying, oh, they spent all their money on everything else, and now they want me to do the cake for nothing. And Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for those uh, bakers because I've heard the story. And I didn't mind saying, bowl your hoop and go on, because I'm not going to do it for nothing, because you weren't able to manage your money. Uh, but other people were not in my position where they could be that contrary. So they have to bite the bullet and try to come to some kind of conclusion because they need the money and need the job. And it is their day-to-day and it's their week-to-week and it's you know part of their income. So I really do commiserate with them. And the other thing that uh, the public doesn't do is let the cake baker know in plenty of time. They think that they can just walk in the week before or a couple of weeks before or a month before, maybe two months tops, and that's enough. Some bakeries obviously can respond because they are big production companies and they can get it out. But if you want something that's a bit more 
like a commission, Kate, with more detail that says a lot more about you than formula, then give mm-hmm. that person plenty of time. Give them six months. Give them 12 months if you can. Why not? You know, the earlier they know, the better. They get the date marked off and they can start planning what they're going to make for you and to make it unique and personal. But that pushes up the cost. And when you are budgeting your wedding, make sure that you budget everything realistically. A realistic amount for the flowers, a realistic amount for the dress, a realistic amount for whatever else that you need, the three-course meal or just the champagne breakfast or whatever. Um, The other thing is that people need to remember is there are only two things that are in that reception room, the bride and the cake. I have yet to hear people tell me, oh, the flowers were fabulous, even though they were. It's always chatter about the cake the cake. And the bride. And the bride is first and the cake is her right hand accent. And the, the main picture of that room is always the bride and groom, who little does he know it is really the sort of second best bit <laughs> in the picture, <laughs> unfortunately. I really feel sad about that because they're almost like spare parts because they're just there. Um but all of the family has been working so hard to make this huge production and then suddenly they are there. And um, and the sad thing is that um, to have a cake that doesn't match this $85,000 dress or the $50,000 dress or the $15,000 dress or the $4,000 dress, it doesn't matter. They should at least look like they're flowing together. And, you know, taking into account what the bridesmaids are going to wear, bringing a bit of color into it so that it's all seamless is very important. And so um, that would be my advice to brides that are planning. Be realistic. Figure out what the total number is and then allocate appropriate amounts to each of the entities so that all of them are in the same vein. You can't have... A three dollar fifty cake with um, you know an eighty five thousand dollar dress it doesn 't work and no, right doesn't. now there 's this huge change in cakedom as I call it with wedding cakes that are traditional wedding cakes that are contemporary, and then there 's the cupcakes that you 've just mentioned with your friends over at Manhattan Beach. Um, where cupcakes have become fashionable for weddings and a lot of people are under the impression that they should be cheaper than a wedding cake. Oh, no, 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 they should not. Because Mm -hmm. there's more work in individually icing each one of those little things in comparison to doing the larger cake. And the larger cake sends a real message, this is my wedding. Sometimes I think that people are so anxious to get to ma- get married that they don't think, what is this going to look 25 or 30 years from now? Will people even care about a cupcake? But a wedding cake has stood the test of time. Stacked or separated, it doesn't matter. Since Queen Victoria's time, when the first cakes began to look like what they are now, um, mm-hmm. You can look back at photographs of brides throughout the decades, throughout the centuries, and it's that cake, that big cake, that everybody talks about. Wow, absolutely. And you should take in consideration it should match your dress. So t- <laughs> well, not every, not, I'm not saying every button, every tier, but yeah, at uh, least when you the, stand in front of it, that it looks like you belong there, that it's not something from outer space. And there you are in a traditional outfit. I tell this story regularly where a bride who had the most beautiful dress and I made a traditional, I made a traditional cake. It was all about dogwoods and ivory and very clean and and elegant lines. And they put it on a Mardi Gras cloth from New Orleans. And to this day, it still upsets me. And it was the catalyst that actually had me talking about creating the Oklahoma State Sugar Art Show in the first place. And sometimes you need a kicker to get you to think about doing something. I thought, I wonder how many cake makers are out there that did have experience just like mine where they put a cake that they made on a totally inappropriate cloth. And so I thought, what if we had a competition 
where not only did they make the cake, but they dressed the table exactly the way they wanted it. And for 22 years, that's exactly what they've been doing. Okay. It's been an amazing ride. Wow. So the last couple of questions real quick. Um, yeah. When, you're, when you start out, your advice, I think you, you, we talked about it at the very beginning, uh, mm-hmm. Of course, you get your licensing and do your due diligence and research. Now you open your bakery. Uh, is a pastry shop and a cake shop, are they the, the same or they should be specialized in one or the other? That question needs to be asked in the business plan. What am I going to be when I grow up? Will mm-hmm. I be a wedding cake specialist that means taking care of all of the cake requirements for special celebrations, or am I going to do bread and butter as well, keep me mobilized, and so would I get into cupcakes, would I get into small pastries, will I be breakfast, will I be lunch, will I be dinner, will I be working all week, working toward the weekend, Um, I determined when I got started, I was thinking about cakes in square inches. And this will give you an example of how you need to think. First of all, if I would do a cake six inches and call it a birthday cake, and if I make another cake six inches and I put it on top of a wedding cake, same amount of decorating, but the cake that I sell for the birthday, I would be lucky to get between 45 and $65 for it because it's so little. And I am going back in time here because I retired from official cake business in 2001. If the same cake with the same amount of decorating is sitting on top of a wedding cake setup, I figured out that that cake was then worth to me around about five to six hundred dollars. So the question is, which one would you make? So I think wow. you have to determine whether or not you can sustain your business by just doing special occasion cakes or whether in your particular area you have a small shop and yes you can have very you may have a lot of staff or very few or none so can you sustain your business life with what you can do every week consistently across the 52 weeks of the year by surviving on weekend business which is mostly where weddings and so forth are focused Everybody wants you at the same time, sadly. Uh, Or do you have to indulge in making other things, pastries for breakfast, little cakes or little tea cakes for luncheons and that sort of thing, or things for the evening or even birthday cakes for children's parties and so forth where you're going to make less money but at least you have income. And I think, first of all, you have to figure out how fast and how quick you can be to get this stuff done, whether or not you're capable, if you're getting into more staff, then you have to consider that you are also needing to pay wages, in which case then you have to determine whether or not you can afford it or not, whether or not you're going to get the return. So it's back initially to what I was talking about as far as the business plan is concerned. Okay. And the last question... Uh, how do you, how a person can get on Food Challenge? And, the main and, thing that every competitor, potential competitor needs to do is get in touch with Food Network, which is in New York, and their address, I don't know it off by heart. In fact, I've never mm-hmm. even been there. Um, in uh, Online, you will find it if you look up the new uh, food, food Network address and send in an audio clip and something about yourself so that they know um, what you can do. You need to have images inside that uh, DVD or CD, uh, some live if you can, if you've been on a local station. I think that you need to get and do some, some work publicly before you ever start approaching them. You also need to be good at your craft before you ever start approaching them. Once you know you have that under your belt, Organize your audio, organize your reel, as they call it, and send in your audition. And they have people who actually go through these things and determine whether or not you are a fit for what they have in mind. They may 
send you off to a production company because the production companies actually do do all of, all of the work. And so Food Network might see a personality that they like the, the look of and they will say then we would like to see this person involved in blah uh, program. So first of all, I would suggest learn your craft. Once you have, have audio and video reel of yourself, have photographs of your work and you, and then you send that off and wait and wait and wait and wait because there are thousands of people daily doing this and they go through piles and piles and piles and heaps of this stuff and they go through it just long enough to find the people that they want. I don't believe that they look at every single thing that comes in, but it is like a raffle. If you have your thing in the raffle, then you will be having a chance. If you don't have your audio DVD in the raffle, quote unquote, then you will never have a chance. And so it's worth it to try, but they are not amused if they open up something and look at it and this person looks like they just started doing cake yesterday. And so okay. it hits the trash really quickly. They don't have time for it. And the, the, the really important thing to remember is if you get on that list of, you know, we don't want, even four years from now when you are good, and want to try again, you can be on that list that never goes away. So don't do it until you're ready. Be assured, be accomplished, and have your television personality honed. They want to see natural people. They don't want somebody looking like they were trying so hard. So once you are comfortable with talking to a camera, and doing the work at the same time without being distracted or your head down focused on the work and all they can see is the top of your head, um, then you are not ready. And you need to get to a point where you know that you are a confident person in front of the camera and you're capable of doing the work. And there are so many people out there that you can watch. For example, the, the, the hobby shows and so forth. And, and Martha particularly, she's a master at standing in front of the camera for four minutes with all of her guests. Watch what they're doing. Don't copy her. You can't be her. She's an icon. Same as Oprah. But you can develop your own personality. And, you know, it, like me, I seem to be cast set into this Simon Cowell of Cake thing. And actually, I don't care. I like Mike, uh, it, it, Simon. I think he does a great <laughs> job. And he's, he's really made a huge number of people. I've been called the dominatrix of decorating. I, I don't know what that's all about, but I don't care because it sounds good and it's, it's fun. And that was in Entertainment Weekly. Um, so... Get yourself some kind of an image, and I have two sides to me. It's the, the, the judge who is going to let you have it, if need be, and give you accolades that you will cherish forever. Um, and on the other side, I'm a mentor. It's two completely different personalities. And I only ended up with the personality I have on television because of some very wise advice by one of the producers who said to me, um, Kerry, you have to be tough. We have to see and hear the good things and the bad things. We don't want la, la, la about everything. And I thought about it and thought, yes, la, la, la doesn't get you anywhere because the people will walk away if I say, oh, it's just so fabulous. Oh, it's so divine. And I know inside my head it's an absolute disaster area. How does that help them get better? And the sad thing is that it has to be said on national television, but nobody twisted anybody's arm to get on national television. They are going like lemmings to the edge of the cliff and jumping off. So there are no excuses. They know that when they come to challenge, I will be the tough one. Patrick was the gentle one. And I was the other side. It was a reverse role where the ma male should probably be the tough one and I should be the gentle one because I was the female. But uh, that's not how the personalities were. I am 
I am hard, but I really, truly want them to do well. And there's nobody happier than me when I see somebody that's had an absolute disaster in a previous episode come through and take that money and it's like thumbs up, great stuff. And you will see with all of the episodes that I've done that people really do appreciate a compliment from me. And um, it, it does make their day. They also don't love hearing when I'm not happy either, but um, it's part of the learning surface and process. Wow. In closing, uh, I mean, yes. we have this great moment. The <laughs> person had one question. He said, well, it does uh, on here, he says, when you walk through the step-by-step for the, the food challenge, the person, of course, top person win $10,000. Uh, what about the other person? Do they get anything at all? No. Um, no. It's sudden it's death with nothing. challenge. Yeah, it's it's all or nothing. And But also, it's like I said, you have a win. People look at it in the real world. Oh, my friend was on TV. Oh, um, that person's on TV. They're on TV. No, they are not on TV. Just that. The whole picture is massive costs of advertising dollars. If you want to pay to have a spot on the Food Network website, it's $75,000 a month just for a tiny banner that you don't even click to go somewhere. Hundreds of thousands of dollars if you would have to pay for the time that you had on challenge if you were buying advertising time. So you need to make hay while the sun shines. If you didn't win the $10,000, you go home and consolidate that effort and turn it into something positive, advertising dollars. Gear everything up for the premiere of your show. Have a watch party if you want to. Invite all of your friends. Have a little evening. Have it in your shop. Have it somewhere local, in a bar or whatever. Lots of them do that. Some of them don't bother to do anything. Make sure that that time you have on air turns itself into a huge advertisement for you. And that's where you're going to win. The $10,000 in the big scheme of things is a great prize for the winner, but nine times out of 10, I would say all of them would say to you, I spent more than $10,000 to get there. Wow. The company, the, the production company pays for their car when they get to town, their flight, round trip, um, pretty much everything else is there. So if you're at the hotel, they pay for so the the main components of transportation and accommodation are covered. The rest of it, it's on your head. And if you have three episodes that you are on and you are paying, such as Bronwyn did, for two and a half to three thousand dollars for FedEx bills, buy by nine thousand dollars, you win ten thousand. So you made a thousand for your effort. So you have to make sure that the rest of it really pays. So you have to be sure that you turn that advertising dollar moment into something positive for yourself. Even if you don't win and you know before you even watch it whether you have or you haven't, but that evening that you're sitting there uh, watching it, you better make sure that it's making money for you. Wow. Well, that's that's really, really awesome. And how long does it normally take? Uh, you meet the contestant the day before, you said mm-hmm. at 7? Okay, and um, they the, the contestants come in uh, the day before they are going to compete, and they have what is called pre-interviews, where they ask them questions about themselves and their backgrounds. Then the judges arrive, and the competitors arrive with the production staff at around about seven, five, between five and seven on the, on the afternoon prior to the show. And they have a conversation about whether or not they have any questions of the judges, clarification of the rules, which is when I find out that they haven't read the rules because then they start asking questions that had they read the rules, they would have had the answer. Um, Then they move in and everything that they want to do for mise en place, which is preparation in English, um, they do the night before and then they have early morning calls around about four o'clock and the cameras are set up, sound is checked, 
lighting's checked, all of those things. They still continue with preparation. There are certain things that they are allowed to prepare, like boiling sugar and so forth, before the the gun goes off. And then, bang, uh, the host comes in, introduces everybody, and the clock starts. And then it's whatever happens on the day is orchestrated, even the surprise moments or the things that they don't want to hear, which is twists that are thrown in to shock them or throw them off their game. And then uh, and sometimes they even have to leave the premises and go somewhere in order to satisfy the request that's made of them for the twist. And then in the evening, um, it's a very long day. They the clock stops, and then the cakes are set up for beauty shots, stills. Then they are asked to move them, and then stills are taken again once they're set up on, after they're moved because not me, not my fellow judges, but production and Main Street audience are waiting for that moment when a cake might fall and they can have the oh my god moment, which I close my eyes because I just know sometimes when they are going to go because they're poorly constructed, and it's almost a given that it's going to happen. Um, and then I'm feeling sorry for the person, but then on the other hand, I'm not feeling sorry also because I know that they did not figure it out properly, and so if they'd have worked out how to stack that cake properly, it should never have happened. Um, then the judges go through, they've been judging all day, they they are walking through the kitchens all the time, and then they go to the final presentation and look to see whether or not um, there are things that they missed in the really bright lights of the production um, place, and then um, we make our final evaluation, and then we go into a private room, and nobody, I have heard people say that, um, you know, we are told what's going to win. Believe me, nobody tells me what to do or think, nor Keegan, nor Patrick. We had independent, independent analyses of what we would decide, plus the visiting judge. The score sheets were tallied and averaged by three, and whoever come out as the top banana, that was the cake that was going to win. And so, um, you know... Then face the judges, which the contestants tell me is the worst part of the entire day because they don't want to be put on the hot seat. And I don't blame them, but it's part of what they wanted to get into. So it's business. You just have to appear. You have to take the lumps with the accolades and then it's over. And then the score sheets are handed to production and they double check to make sure that the additions are correct and then the host makes the announcement to all four that are called to the stage and one by one they disappear until the last one standing is the winner and then the final little chitter chatter from the host welcoming everybody and saying thank you for being a viewer for this particular episode and we'll see you next week and bye-bye, and then we have competitors who are in tears of joy and screaming or sh shell-shocked because they didn't think that they were going to, and others who are in tears because they lost, and others who are wanting to kick themselves because they did things that normally they would not do, but they just had a really bad day. And so that is a day on challenge, and then the next day, all of the competitors are called back in for another post uh, episode interview which is how did you feel you know what really stomped you and what was a an incredible roadblock to you and then all of those are conducted I think they're 90 minutes and then they all start heading home off to the airport many of them drive across the country they rather bring their vans with everything in the kitchen sink in it and so that yep. is a day on challenge, which then all of that is actually condensed down to 42, 44 minutes. And there have been actually 24 hours of serious filming from, oh, I think, at least nine or ten sets of camera crew. So it's huge. 
Okay. Is it a film with a live audience or is it just all studio? We used to have a live audience, but unfortunately the, the live audience didn't obey instructions. And if they had <laughs> um, cameras flashing and we had a, a very placid producer, but once pushed, one time more was too much, who walked in once one day and just said, we are not having them anymore. I'm losing hundreds of hours of footage because people are talking when we've asked them to shut up. We have them talking and shooting cameras and having private conversations that were creeping into the judges' conversations or the the repartee that was happening between produ production and the competitor because each one of them has their own film crew and um, you can hear this overriding conversation going on about things that have nothing to do with challenge and they were finding it a challenge to get rid of it and because it was so <laughs> expensive um, and I mean they didn't mind not having the canned laughter and so forth with real people it sounds a lot nicer and more spontaneous and I think for a few episodes for us we feed a little bit off the, the audience because between takes we would go and visit and have little chats and so forth. And, and a lot of them were people who kept coming over and over again. They were very disappointed when it quit. And some of them behaved well and actually were censored because of the people who did not behave well. So wow. um, it spoiled it. And I, I remember the first few episodes without them, it sort of seemed dead but then after a while, we kind of got used to it and things just rolled on as usual. But I missed okay. them and, and they were, you know, sort of a uplifting, I think, to us. But um, And especially, see, when the judges are doing the shows, they are not just doing one show and going away. With the three-day program that you that I just mentioned, ours was rolling continuously, so we were really working hugely horrible hours, 16, 18 hours a day. So when one group of competitors leave when, at the finish of one show, we would start again. They would be packing up and the new contestants would be coming in for a judges meeting. We'd head off to the hotel and we'd start it all over again. And then the next day, more judging and competitors at the end of the day after the announcement was made for the team that was coming the next day. So we would actually have three days straight off, which was really, really tiring because you got very little sleep, a day break, and then two, and then you would go home. So we were shooting five challenges at once. Oh, And so okay. if you are actually there till 11, 11.30 at night, and then expected to be on set at 5.30 in the morning, 6 o'clock. That was a really, really long time because you had to go back to a hotel, so there was 30 minutes traveling time in there, and you're mm -hmm. keyed up. It's hard to go to sleep, and you have. To, we were never fed lines. Nobody ever told us what to say. You can't keep saying the same thing over and over again from one episode to the next. So not only do you have to keep your vocabulary fresh, but you also have to look like you're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, which was pretty hard <laughs> by day five, believe me. So you do it in five-day blocks, and how often do you tape the show? Um, always through the winter, and um, we start usually in October and end mm -hmm. around about, um, oh, sometimes April, sometimes May. Right now we're in hiatus, so... Um, we're, you know, waiting to see what's going to happen next. Um, you know, there's so many things on television at the moment that I think they have a glut of cake stuff. So we, last year we did many, many more than we usually do, and so they're slower to get off the ground this year. So we'll see where it goes from here. Okay, great. And with uh, this last question regarding the when you uh, start uh, calculating people's scores, uh, you all, does all the judges talk to each other? You guys don't talk to each other. You uh, you give your score and you give it to the the person who's going to collect it, and then right. they read it. So you guys don't even talk. So about throughout the, the day, okay. uh, sorry, it's sorry to interrupt there. Throughout the day, uh, we are evaluating. 
we are constantly being asked as a group of three what we think about this and that and things change. So initially, you know, you may see person getting off with a really bad start in the morning. So you're going to talk about it as in real time. And that may or may not make it to the final act on television. Um, but all of us are having impressions as we go through that day. None of us tell anybody else what we think. I say what I feel when I'm on camera, but I'm not sitting in a corner, say, for example, having a little conversation with Keegan, say, what do you think, what do you think? And he's not asking me, what do I think? He doesn't mm -hmm. care what I think because we have to be independent judges. I can't care about what he thinks. The reason for having three people is to get three impressions, three adjudications of what's going on, and then each of us has different skill in different departments. So, you know, I am very geared towards cake decoration and what goes on with that. If we're into cake baking and so forth, Keegan really loves to get into that. It's more specialty. I do more cakes than they do. The visiting judge is more about interpretation of theme, whatever we've chosen for the day. Usually the person is chosen for their expertise level, not in cake or sugar or baking, but what they can bring to the table with the best interpretation of the theme that is actually being visited that day. So they will have probably tougher points with interpretation of the theme than maybe I might, but they have not very much opinion when it comes to general decoration and cake making. They can look at it from uh, a technical or artistic visual what appeals to them. I'm going to nail it when it comes down to technical value, which is the big key, because on the television cameras, no matter how big they are, all of the cakes, even the bad ones, look pretty good on TV. But when you are looking at them front, both sides and back, you see things up close that nobody sitting in an armchair is ever going to see. So when we get criticism because we didn't get the right cake, we may have had a very even score across the board for artistic value, for example, because they all looked good. But mm -hmm. when I get into technical expertise and cake one is really an amazing effort, say, for the amount of time that they had to devote on that, but cake two visually looks good, but it's an absolute slop when it gets down to technical expertise. Cake one may not be the people's favorite, but it will be the one that will win because it had enough points in both categories to make it. There's a lot more that goes into it. There's lots of different sure. areas. Um, but those are just two examples of the things that don't, I mean, the, the, the viewing public, they don't care about the technical value because they're just looking at the visual and they love the visual of particular things. And they can't be in my shoes standing with my nose three inches from something because no matter how close the camera gets, it's always going to be three to four feet away. And then when it gets onto their screen, no screen's big enough to match the real thing. So they often give criticism about our choices, but I beg them to reconsider because I believe that they need to understand that they are seeing it from a completely different perspective. I can see if somebody dropped something on the board and it shouldn't be there and they didn't clean it up. And I'm even more cross with them if I saw them do it I even will walk past and say, hmm, are you going to fix that? And they, mm -hmm, yeah, 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 yeah. And they finish early and say, okay, they're just standing around twiddling their thumbs. And I go back in the final inspection and find all of that rubbish still there. 
So that doesn't, I mean, they even got an oblique sort of warning to, to pay attention. But in the fray, yes, I know they're under pressure. They don't pay attention. That is a very foolish competitor because the one thing I would never do if I was a competitor was ignore a judge who is pointing something out, not telling you what to do, but just, you know, that looks a little sloppy. And I don't do it to one person in exclusion of the other. I mention it to all of them evenly so that they all get the opportunity to fix something that's not right. And most of the time, they ignore it. And I say fool them because they should fix it. Okay. In closing, what words of advice you would have for people who are looking at, number one, starting this industry, number two, who's in the industry and they want to to home in on a craft, and number three, if you're going to come on the challenge? I think everything before you get started in anything, as I said in the beginning, you need mm-hmm. to learn your craft. Go to classes. Start out with Wilton classes at your local Michaels, Garden Ridge, those sort of places that uh, Hobby Lobby has classes. And all of the craft stores across the country have in-store cake decoration classes. They will teach mm-hmm. you how to basically pipe, how to make a normal single-tiered cake. Then you have to find out who the leaders are in your area. People have a reputation for being good. And try to get to join in workshops or go to days of sharing where cake decoration is, um, techniques are shared and be involved with that. You need to grow inch by inch. You cannot catapult yourself from your Wilton beginners class straight onto TV or straight into a business. You need to figure out by reading. I'm self-taught, actually. I didn't have a teacher. And so uh, you can do it. The only sad thing about being self-taught is you do pay with time because you have to learn to figure it out. And But it's not impossible, and there are many out there who have learned that way, who were forced to learn, particularly in my era, because there weren't a ton of teachers out there to go to. Now there are teachers ten a penny, but the standard of the teachers is not always fabulous. So you need to see online. It's so easy to ask questions on Facebook and through Fantourage and all of those places with social media who people think are great teachers. You can look at their work and see that what they are doing is not mundane, it's inspired. And every day of our lives, we should always be in student mode. I am, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it or how good you are or who you are, you are never too old to learn. And that's an old adage that still stands true to this day. And with business... Inch by inch, you decide where you're going to fit, whether you're going to be by commission, which means you'll take longer doing a cake, you will charge more, and you'll be more detail-oriented, or whether you want to be production, which means it's going to be formula cakes. You go in, you take a look as a customer at a book, and there'll be minor details that will be changed, but there'll be a, a price made out. It won't be figured out, and away you go. So... Um, I think you have to determine which playground you want to be in and which is, and there are many of us that some of us want to be in custom. I was in custom. Others want to be in production because they like to work fast and they don't want to be too detail oriented and they love the protection of being in a bakery where, you know, they know that their pay is coming in weekly when you're in commissioned work. You don't know if you're going to have to have a cake, so you have to learn to market yourself. It's a slightly different way of doing things. But no matter what you're in, do the best that you can, and you will always stand out because others around you will recognize that you have that it factor. And if you have that it factor, then you will do well. 
Um, if you are doing it because you just have to have a job, it will look like it. And you probably don't need to be in this job. You need to be in somebody else's job, um, something else that you will like to do better and enjoy your day. I love what I do. And a lot of people sound, say to me that I sound really serious when I'm talking about stuff. It's because I am really invested in what I do. I am serious about it. I have a hell of a sense of humor when you start talking about stuff that is entertaining. But when I'm asked questions about what we should do and how we should do it, it's very important that I get the message over. And it's not a joke. It is somebody's life that I am helping mold and direct. And I want them to really truly know that I I'm doing my best to point them in the right direction. Wonderful and well said. Uh, in closing, what is your favorite cake? Uh, white cake or chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> the last one I ever made. <laughs> All of them, because I won't make recipes that I don't like, number one. And recipes are developed over periods of time. If I was American, the answer would probably be I, I, I love chocolate. But I love all sorts of well-made cake, and I've had some really great ones, and I've had some cake that I've had to swallow that I wished I'd never had to have eaten. And that is the most important thing that anybody has to make. The underpinnings of that perfectly iced and perfectly decorated cake is the taste. And I don't care how brilliant the decorating is. If I take a bite of that cake and it feels like I'm eating sheetrock, I'm sorry, you failed. You failed. Well, I'm going to leave it mm -hmm. at that. The best cake you ever <laughs> the last one you made. <laughs> That's a horrible I mean... way to end the conversation, but <laughs> no, it's so it's, true. It's, it's fun. We've got to keep things fun and exciting. I really appreciate you coming on the program. We're supposed to be doing like 45 minutes. When, uh, what, we went three hours? <laughs> But I just couldn't resist because you were get, uh, giving people so much wealth of information from the the back scenes of what happens on the Food Network, your experience, your advice, the things that they need to do when they start. Maybe some people don't realize they can go rent a kitchen. They can go to a church and rent a kitchen. Absolutely. Don't have, keep it at your own house. So that, that simple information, when we spent the first half hour on, that was great. Because maybe somebody didn't know they could do that. Sure, yeah, the there's all sorts of organizations, not just the church. Anybody, mm -hmm. any organization that has a public kitchen, if they're willing to rent at night, go for it. Great. And we're going to leave it at that. I really appreciate it. Carrie Vincent, Food Network Judge. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you, Timothy, and thank you to all the listeners for joining us. I think it's been a really interesting uh, conversation, and I hope that it really is useful for each and every one of you. And if it's something that you've forgotten that I reminded you, so much the better. I think everybody okay. knows it. Sometimes you just have to say it. You have to say it. You were right. doing good with it. Good luck with your book, and I look thank forward to you. you some in the near future. It's Take a care. Great of break from the book. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Okay, Thank you. Timothy. Take care. Have a great afternoon. Right. Bye. Same here. But this has been another production of Apple Cap me uh, Apple Capital Group sponsoring us, the Core Business Show. Thank you for listening for this hour and fifty minutes. Uh again you can download this episode on Block Talk Radio Network, on iTunes, on blog.applecapital group. Thank you for joining the program today and listening. And have a great day. I'm gonna conclude with the last nine minutes of the Food Network show which I'm going to get permission for. And I'm going to go ahead and play that, and then we go uh, close with our closing intro. So here it is. Thank you for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet. For more information about equipment financing and asset-based loans, visit our website, applecapitalgroup.com. That's applecapitalgroup.com. Or call us at 866-611-7457. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. And remember, you can always get to the core via iTunes. You'll find all our previous episodes there. And thanks again for listening to The Core Business Show with Tim Jacquet.